The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Ontario is a Great Lakes province, but it's also brimming with inland lakes. And tonight, we'll hear the case for why Lake Simcoe deserves greater, if not Great Lake, attention. Then from laneway houses to the Toronto mayoral race, we've got the Agenda's Week in Review. It's Friday, May 26th, and that's tonight on The Agenda. Lake Simcoe is the largest lake in southern Ontario outside of the Great Lakes and the fourth largest one completely within the provincial boundaries. With growing cities such as Barrie, Aurelia and Innisfil on its shores, it's long been home to First Nations communities beloved as part of cottage country and vital for the rich farming lands all around it. Needless to say, that adds up to pressure. With us now on how well it's holding up, let's welcome... Jonathan Scott, Councillor for Ward 2 for the Town of Bradford, West Gillenbury. Dave Neeson, Councillor, Ward 3 for the Town of Georgina. Claire Malcolmson, Executive Director of the Rescue Lake Simcoe Coalition. And Margaret Prophet, Executive Director of the Simcoe County Greenbelt Coalition. Hi to everyone. Hi. Thanks so much for coming in. I know you all came from far, and it's <laughs> far nice far. to have you in the studio. And Jonathan, um, give me a slap on the wrist, because I don't think I said West Gwillenberry correctly. You got it right the second time. I did. <laughs> it's always the second time. Uh, but thanks so much for being here. Lots to get into before we start our discussion. I just wanted to uh, go through some facts and figures of what Lake Simcoe means. Here's a map of Lake Simcoe with the communities of Aurelia, Barrie, Innisfil, Bradford West, Gwillenbury, that's Jonathan's ward, Georgina, that's Dave's ward, Beaverton, and Georgina Island in the lake itself. And here are some numbers about the lake according to the Lake Simcoe Region Conservation Authority. It is 722 square kilometers, 20 municipal boundaries, home to more than 450,000 people, 24 conservation areas. Before we talk about some of the challenges that are facing Lake Simcoe, I wanted to start with why you became interested in the issue. I'll start with you, Dave. Certainly, yeah. I mean, um, listen, for the town of Georgina and, and all of our residents, I mean, Lake Simcoe really is our, it's our identity. I mean, it's our, uh, it's our drinking water. It's our recreational uses year round. You know, we're the ice fishing capital of Ontario, as an example. And so, you know, whether it's uh, wintertime, we're out on the lake ice fishing and certainly a, a large tourist attraction as well in that regard. Um, or whether it's in the summer, you know, going swimming, going boating, uh, etc. So uh, Lake Simcoe really is our, uh, is our identity. And I also have to add, um, you know, in terms of, um, um, you know, population of the lake is also, uh, uh, Lake Simcoe is also uh, uh, home to First Nations since time immemorial. And so um, Georgian Island First Nation is also our, our good friends and neighbours and uh, we're very proud of that. It sounds like a truly magical place. Claire, what about you? Well, a lot of what Dave said I would echo as well. Um, for me, I mean, my, my family started cottaging in Innisfil in 1889. Wow. And so for wow. me, you know, Lake Simcoe is sort of the environment that I studied up close, you know, crawling on my belly, uh, <laughs> doing, you know, kids games in the woods and stuff like that and swimming and learning to sail and canoe. Uh, so that for me, you know, is a real legacy of sort of stewardship, land stewardship, um, taking care and, and seeing there how much work goes into having to to take care of the environment, take care of a healthy forest. Uh, I became really curious about what was going on at the lake. I could observe changes and no one around me could really explain what was happening. And the Conservation Authority had some information and so I started to explore and I ended up creating a program and it kind of launched my career. You said something that I find fascinating. Uh, what do you mean by stewardship? Well, um, you know, the First Nations actually were stewarding the lands that they lived on in North America, of course, for time immemorial. And so we learned from them that you have to take care of your forests. You've got to uh, make sure that the invasive species, for example, are removed. You have to, you know, help support the right the right species of trees and so on. It's sort of easier to understand in a forest, but in the in the lake itself, um, there's a lot of work that goes into protecting uh, the species that are those keystone species that reflect to us how the lake is doing. Mm -hmm. At Lake Simcoe, that's the lake trout and whitefish. Those are the, the centerpiece of our 
uh, of the tourism around the lake, really. Mm -hmm. and so, so it's not we, just about enjoying it, but also taking ownership and yeah. responsibility to take care of it. That's right. Uh, what about you, Margaret? Well, again, similar to Dave and Claire, uh, once you're in Simcoe County, you're going to be affiliated or have some affinity to a body of water, whether it be Wasaga Beach or Minnesota Wetlands or Nottawasaga River, Lake Simcoe. And um, so as when our coalition formed in 2017, we started off with really being concerned about water writ large in the, in the region and started to look into what was happening to Lake Simcoe as one of the watersheds. And the Intergovernmental Action Plan in 2006 said basically, you know, Lake Simcoe isn't doing great because of urbanization and growth. And to the point where the scientists came out saying, oh, well, you know, we have to do something very significant because the aqua culture of the watersheds are at risk. So that actually really started um, delving more into if we have these kind of warnings, what are we doing? And so we delve more into what's happening in Lake Simcoe and mm. what's happening to these watersheds. Because at the end of it, it's for the people around this panel and the people that we represent, it's really not just about water. There are livelihoods and economies and families that their futures depend on the health of that lake. It's not just a policy for us. I, I want to go to Jonathan next, but you said something that maybe not everyone is familiar with. What is a watershed? So a watershed is um, where it's, it's an interconnected system system of streams and wetlands and forests and aquifers, all these things that work together almost like a family uh, to make sure that water flows and it's clean and accessible. Um, so it's, it's little pieces in a toolbox, if you will, that all goes together. Mm. And what about you, Jonathan? Well, growing up in Bradford West Gloomery, we're the carrot capital of Canada. The Holland Marsh is known for its fertile soil. And I've always had an interest in environmental activism, one of the first things I did in high school was to demand that our MP prioritize climate change. And from university working in the provincial government, working in pri the private sector for environmental NGOs, I'd, I'd always had that passion for environmental conservation stewardship and really putting the climate crisis squarely in public policy. So when I was elected about two and a half years ago and my ward contains most of the Holland River flowing into Lake Simcoe and a portion of the Holland Marsh, mm -hmm. I really wanted to try to find ways practically for all levels of government to work with activists and conservation authorities to protect the lake, protect the Holland River, protect the Holland Marsh. You know, our farmers steward the land themselves too, and they've done a fantastic job on this, but it's governments that have let the growth happen in our region without the infrastructure, especially the environmental infrastructure that's needed to mitigate the impacts of that growth. And as municipalities, we're trying to densify and grow up near our growth train rather than out. But the sprawl has been happening for the past quarter century, and we have to do something about it. We're going to come back to that. Uh, but you mentioned that you know you grew up in that um, region, and yeah. uh, you're committed to it in a way that I think a lot of us may be not familiar with. Uh, but if Lake, you know, um, do you think that uh, obviously Lake Simcoe is not one of the five great lakes but is it just as important yeah it is and I, i've even heard people call it the little great lake because it, it is such a large lake in the middle of central ontario you were right when you said it's sort of the start of cottage country and so this part of the province we as, as dave was saying we live on our lakes year round and enjoy them and our economies are affiliated with them if not based on our, our water and whether it's the individual rivers the lake itself the marsh uh we have a lot to lose if we don't protect our watersheds. Margaret, is it just as important as the Great Lakes? Absolutely. I, I mean, it, it is a sense of place, and I would argue that not only is Lake Simcoe important, but all of the, the tributaries that feed into it, all the rivers and streams, those are important to people, right? All of the, when you go into an area, you probably have places around your home that you're like, this is really important to me. So we, we kind of put this hierarchy of like, well, if it's big enough, then it's important, but they're all important. And Lake Simcoe, of course, being like, like Jonathan said, is a keystone. It supports almost a half a billion dollar uh, recreational um, economy a year. So so it is important, but I would argue that you know all of these places that are meaningful to people that provide drinking water are important. Well, when we talk about challenges, uh, what does having a healthy Lake Simcoe mean for the surrounding communities, Dave? Um, well, I mean that's a great question. I mean, at the end of the day, um, you know, access to clean water is important. Um, you know, it's important to point out our First Nations still doesn't have access to it, and I mean, you know, it's one of the most southern uh, First Nations there is, and so, you know, again, going back to the, the original point of. Um, you know, protecting source, source point water throughout the throughout the watershed, throughout the streams, throughout the river systems, the groundwater, the aquifers, etc. 
all of which feeding into the lake. I mean, it's important that we protect them not only in, in you know, in regard to you know phosphorus loading and salt pollution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you know, also there's contaminated sites throughout the watershed, and so. You know, these are things that we need to look towards uh, other levels of government that uh, Councillor Scott and I and certainly uh, Margaret and Claire have all worked in a collaborative fashion uh, in a nonpartisan sense to get other upper level levels of government, you know, to show that commitment because Lake Simcoe is important, you know, for all the reasons that my colleagues here have, have pointed out. And so, um, but I think bearing in, in mind over and atop the recreational and the tourism uh, aspects of the lake, which are important. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned, uh, Mayor Quirk, uh, our mayor in the town of Georgina, always point out it's, it's our identity. But uh, it's important to note that it's our, our source of drinking water. Yeah. Right? And so that's uh, water is life, as the saying goes. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, without that access to clean drinking water, you know, n none of the, the watershed municipalities exist, period. You mentioned the collaboration and this being a nonpartisan issue. I want to come back to that, but I sure. wanted to get more, a better understanding of what other challenges are facing Lake Simcoe. Claire? Right, so uh, most of the viewers, I think, would be familiar with Lake Erie mm -hmm. and the many, many decades that we have been trying to save Lake Erie. Oh, Lake Erie's better. Oh, Lake Erie's not better. We so, actually had a whole week on it. Right? So <laughs> Lake Simcoe is very similar um, sort of in terms of the shape of the lake, the fact that they're relatively shallow, and the fact that they've lost a lot of wetlands, both lakes, and that there's a lot of farming in the area. So uh, loss of natural heritage over time, those are forests and wetlands, uh, lots of phosphorus pollution, so this is in fertilizers, it's also in soil, it's in manure, it's in sewage, septic systems. Uh, it also falls from the sky <laughs> because um, whenever you strip a site bare for farming or for development, and you leave it, especially if you leave it for a long time, the wind whips up that dirt and it, it becomes airborne. And so about 30% of the phosphorus loads mm -hmm. that affect Lake Simcoe come from the air. So uh, what are the factors that contribute to these things? Uh, of course, farming. Development, though, is the one that I think we ought to focus quite a lot on. And that is because it is the growing impact on the lake. Like, farming is relatively stable. All the other sort of stressors, invasive species, you know, they do come and go. They're a factor. Um, but the development is the thing that we can definitely control. Um, and of course, climate change. We can't forget climate change. These things interact with each other to create conditions that uh, warm up the water, fertilize plants, uh, and those conditions combine often to lower the amount of available oxygen for the fish. Mm -hmm. um, so we use the fish as that keystone, like how are you doing? And, and the fish are not doing as well as they should be. And so we need to be paying attention to the sources of pollution that affect those conditions. Jonathan? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. And I, I often say growth is the original sin of a lot of these stressors because the phosphorus runoff in particular is uh, causing the lake to have lower oxygen levels. The plant life, you think a fertilizer is inherently a good thing for plants, but if you have too much of a good thing, it's causing stress to the lake. So we've uh, been working collaboratively with municipalities across the watershed to convince the federal and provincial government to build a Lake Simcoe phosphorus recycling facility that will take some of the phosphorus out of the lake, secured $40 million in federal and provincial funding to deliver it. We now wanna see that funding put into action and shovels in the ground to deliver the facility. Likewise, we've been trying to find a way to, uh, one, of, one of the bright spots in the Harper government's environmental record was something called the Lake Simcoe Cleanup Fund, but it expired in 2018. And the Trudeau Liberals are proposing to bring in a freshwater action fund of 650 million. Just this week, they announced the agency that would administer it, but we wanna see that money flowing into the lake. We've had almost five years without the fund in place and those environmental restoration projects that could be being funded through that money mm -hmm. are so needed. I, I mean, Claire mentioned agriculture. We make our farmers do a lot of phosphorus offsetting on the farm, but we don't necessarily make the governments do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, Dave, I saw you nodding. Oh, yeah, just I think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm just agreeing with, uh, with Councillor Scott. But yeah, I mean, a lot of work has gone into sort of, um, you know, the four of us actually collectively around this table sort of lobbying, um, you know, all of the, the watershed municipalities to sort of get on board and call on the various um, levels of government, whether it was the, the province and the Fed combined with respect to the, um, uh, the phosphorus recycling plant or whether it was sort of the groundswell that we worked on uh, to call on the Trudeau Liberals to deliver on a freshwater action fund for which uh, John had sort of pointed out. But, um, you know, it's sort of um, perhaps a little bit novel 
uh, in the in the watershed to, for uh, for municipalities to work together in this way. But it's been really successful with uh, you know the groundswell from citizens and you know ENGOs, uh, municipal governments, conservation authority, etc. Yeah. You say it's novel uh, for the municipalities to work together. I think it's refreshing to see yeah. people mm -hmm. yeah. across. Uh, political parties work in this way because as you mentioned from the very beginning this is about sort of stewardship right mm -hmm. it's the one yeah. area where the conservatives want the liberals to spend more money it's great <laughs> it's nonpartisan in that sense yeah I, I just wanted to to be a little blunt with it too all the things that Claire and Jonathan and, and <coughs> Dave mentioned is true but to really cut through the the greatest um, threat to Lake Simcoe is political will, the lack of political yeah. will at the mm -hmm. higher levels and the provincial levels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I am starting to feel there's a lot of performative politics with, we love Lake Simcoe, we're going to put on our campaign materials, we're going to wrap ourselves in that flag when we go to farmers markets, and um, the hypocrisy of it, especially with, with this particular provincial government, of we love Lake Simcoe, we're going to make sure that it's protected, and at the same time drive highways uh, through its watershed, at the same time remove endangered species protection, at the same time break greenbelt promises and cut out those those. Um, supportive things, cut out uh, protections for wetlands. Mm -hmm. These things are exactly opposite of what the science says we need to do. We have a climate crisis that's here and it's going to be getting worse. Mm -hmm. And the fact is, unless the feds and the, the provincial MPPs stop feeling like it's just a vote getter, it's something just to make it seem like we really care, but then follow up with policies that are absolutely destructive, then it doesn't really, it, 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 I'm just tired of the hollowness of it all. Well, we will, Jonathan, not, we yeah. will not applaud that kind of behavior. Yeah. So I, I just want to- I'm gonna come to you, Jonathan, after that. But okay, go ahead. I wanna point out what the province has to do. So yes. the province passed in 2008, the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan. This is the best watershed-based legislation in Canada. I mean, the Great Lakes, some of the Great Lakes Protection Act is based on this. So we have the best, to Margaret's point, this has to be delivered. You have to pay attention, you've got to do the science, you've got to implement, you have to make tough decisions, mm -hmm. such as, we're not gonna let you build here because there's no sewage capacity, right? Or you're gonna have to really increase the amount of uh, water conservation that you do if you wanna build here. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of very innovative tools in this Lake Simcoe Protection Plan that make growth pay for growth. And arguably, this is what we should be doing across Southern Ontario to mitigate the impacts of growth. So there are programs that reduce the amount of stormwater that would flow quickly off a site uh, for new development. There are ways to get money from developers if their projects do contribute phosphorus pollution to the Lake Simcoe watershed. And unfortunately, those are two programs that the government of Ontario has started to mess with. They're some of the most interesting, innovative, and important pieces of it. So it's been really frustrating for us to not be able to have much dialogue with the provincial government about this very important lake and the implementation of its plan. Uh, we want greater access to decision makers. And if that was happening, you might not see this really interesting partnership that we have here with, with our municipal politicians. But we will work with anybody who will work with us. <laughs> and that's why we're working with these guys. And we're all together trying to get the province to do the homework that's written right here. Jonathan, I wanted to just give you um, an opportunity to respond because how do you balance that need for the infrastructure like the Bradford Bypass with development and also protecting the environment? Well, I think in part by following the Lakes and Coal Protection Plan. And if you're <laughs> going to do any sort of development, it has to be sustainable development. And whether that means offsets or mitigation, doing things differently, scrutinizing things properly, uh, I, I don't want to say any individual thing is inherently bad. It has to be done properly. And so w whether, whether we agree or disagree on a particular piece of infrastructure, <clears throat> the process actually matters. And the public confidence in that process is paramount as well. I didn't want to put you on the no, spot, it's, but I think, I think you gave me an answer. <laughs> but I'll take what you said. Uh, Dave? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I can add um, uh, really to what the group has said is, yeah, it, it's truly about the process. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our council was pretty clear, um, I believe, back in 2020, 2021, somewhere in around there, um, you know, where we, we asked the, um, you know, the provincial government quite clearly by way of resolution, which was unanimous, was, you know, to follow the existing policies that are on the books and, um, and go through the process and, and voluntarily, in fact, involve the Conservation Authority uh, as an oversight body. And so, 
Um, you know, we've been pretty clear uh, in the town is that, you know, we understand the need and we live it every day with respect to east-west connections. It can be very difficult. Mm -hmm. So, um, but at the end of the day, it's about the process. And so, you know, um, I guess what everyone here would agree upon is if you're going to do it, you need to do it properly. You need to respect the natural environment. And, you know, that may take all sorts of different forms. But to, to Jonathan's point is that, you know, the public has to have confidence in that, um, in that process. Um, is that about the process, Margaret? Well, I think I'll just backtrack a little bit that the public should have zero public confidence in this process. I mean, we're dealing with uh, studies that are over 30 years old. They changed the Environmental Assessment Act to streamline it, which basically renders it meaningless to there's very little legislative uh, responsibilities that they have to do once they find out there's problems. Lake Simcoe isn't being studied. Cumulative impacts to the climate are not being studied. We have uh, air pollution. You know, when you asked Jonathan the question of is it a benefit, I think benefit did a lot of heavy lifting in that sense because what is the benefit when you increase air pollution where you're having children and older people with more Alzheimer's and asthma and lung-related diseases <coughs> because of the proximity to the highway? What is the benefit of a two to four billion dollar highway that'll be one of the most expensive highways uh, that Ontario has built in recent history. What is the benefit of pouring an, an, an enormous amount of salt into the headwaters of Lake Simcoe, which supports a regional economic tourism? There, there really is not a lot of benefit. And what we have seen is this government continues to push through. Um, they dole out the misinformation. And at the same time, conveniently roll out the we love the green belt, we love the lake, we care about our environment, and intentionally change policies and laws to make it so they don't have to follow their own rules. They are writing the rules of the test, they're writing the test, they're answering the test, they're marking the test. What kind of process is that? Mm -hmm. and in fairness, I just want to point out that um, the government was re-elected in part because they said that they would be uh, building more infrastructure, more highways. I just thought I should just mention that. Um, mm -hmm. Claire, you brought us some pictures of Lake Simcoe. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us? I'm going to bring them up and you can tell us what it is that we're looking at. Oh my gosh. This is farmland. This is Annisville. Um, and right behind that line of trees is a subdivision that has was approved uh, more than 10 years ago. So it's this kind of landscape where we grow food, uh, where water can sink through the soil, recharge our groundwater and our aquifers. Uh, this is this is really important part of the landscape, and it's just interesting how I think it it hides the fact that now there's a subdivision going in right behind. We have another one too over there. Yeah, this is just um, a pretty naturalized shoreline with uh, with a bit of an awkward old piece of concrete on the shore. My son uh, exploring the shore. So this is really just. You know, people use the lake in all sorts of uh, fun and interesting ways. Oh, this is a nasty one. This is basically, this is what would happen if we do not take care of Lake Simcoe. This is actually at Lake Simcoe. This is duckweed in a little inlet uh, in the Georgina area somewhere about 15 That's years ago. And so this is what happens when you have too much fertilizer, mm -hmm. not enough water flow, uh, the weeds and aquatic plants just grow like crazy and it chokes out other, other life. And so... So we have a final picture here? Oh yeah, well this is Big Bay Point. This was supposed to be good for the lake, right? <laughs> uh, so... From your laugh, from this is... <laughs> You're not... It's an inside joke. <laughs> it's an inside. Yeah, so this is Big Bay Point, now Friday Harbor, um, massive development. I mean, you can just see the scale of something like this. Like there mm. were, there were Blanding's turtles in here. Uh, this is the kind of development that is a threat to the integrity of the natural systems that have to stay connected throughout the watershed. Um, I do want to point out one thing that the lake absolutely needs is natural heritage protection. So like the rest of Ontario, mm -hmm. um, we have provincial policies that protect significant forests, provincially significant wetlands. We are concerned that the government might weaken those policies and that would be disastrous for Lake Simcoe and for the rest of Southern Ontario. You know, we've lost something like 90% of the original wetlands in the very southern part of, of, uh, of Ontario and Lake Erie area. You can see what that does, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we need to protect the natural heritage. Um, that helps filter pollutants. It helps store stormwater. You know, we have to address what climate change is bringing to us. 
And Lake Simcoe is really just um, a reflection of what is coming mm -hmm. to other places. It is the poster child for what we have to do to take care of our environment. If we want to have good, clean water for recreation, boating, drinking, all the life processes for all the critters and fish that live in the lake. Um, Who has jurisdiction over Lake Simcoe? What, oh, what, well, what, 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 well <laughs> no, Ontario, I mean, it should be much easier to manage than the Great Lakes because it's entirely within Ontario. Ontario was responsible for administering the Lake Simcoe Protection Act and plan, but Conservation Authority, well, less now because the province has gutted a lot of those responsibilities, but the Conservation Authority has quite a lot of responsibility. So do the municipalities, and so do residents and, and citizen groups like ours. Jonathan? Well, it's funny you ask who has jurisdiction over the lake, because I've actually heard municipalities, municipal leaders argue, well, I don't have jurisdiction over that precisely. But we all do, every level of government, and it has to work collaboratively. And our region is so rapidly growing, and it's not going to stop. We are the region, more than most, where they are looking to put a lot of the housing uh, to deal with the housing affordability crisis. But we have to do it in a smart and sustainable way, not more sprawl, which is what has happened for the last quarter century. And so we can talk about all the infrastructure that hasn't been kept up. We still don't have a, a twin go train to deliver regional express rail in and out of the city. I think Margaret came down on the go train today and it took Yay. her two hours to get to oh. the middle of Toronto. That should be much easier. So mm -hmm. it, we, we need all levels of government. Dave and I have spoken to some initiatives that we've done, but it has to be much more macro than that because I'm either the fastest growing municipality in the province in Bradford, and if it's not us that year, it's our neighbors in East Cloneberry. So that responsibility to follow the Lake Simcoe Protection Plan, respect the role of conservation authorities, work with the development community to do things properly, especially around density, especially around transit, those are some of the really macro solutions we need to explore. And it has a ripple effect, no pun intended, on everything else we're talking about. If you talk about traffic congestion versus the environment, that's a false choice because what we actually have to talk about is how do you have development done in a sustainable way so people have places to live, but we're not at the same time compromising our drinking water or compromising our natural habitat that holds it all and is where we all live at the end of the day. There seems to be a disconnect from people who live in the GTA to what's happening outside of the GTA. Is there a little bit of frustration for you? Well, yes, especially in Bradford, because we're sort of the northernmost municipality in the GTA and the southernmost in South Simcoe. We've been a suburb for the past 15 years or more, uh, and, and managing how that works within a county that's much more rural, agricultural, and even cottage country mm -hmm. is its own set of challenges. But I, I think what I would just say to, to your question around how is this perceived from Toronto versus how is this perceived from Lake Simcoe? We see the results right away. Claire showed a photo of a beautiful farm with a subdivision behind it. People don't necessarily like that. It's not nimbyism so much as it is a desire to see growth happen properly, whether that's having transportation networks, whether that's having environmental respect and mitigation, or even whether that's having the community centers and the good cultural places you need. We're a region going, growing so fast that we have to be able to manage it, and it is going to take all levels of government. It's also going to take activists reminding levels of government when we get it wrong. We've got 30 seconds. I'm going to give it to you, Margaret. What would you like the federal and provincial governments to do in terms of investment? Uh, I would like to see to reestablish the investments that they had promised uh, with the phosphorus reduction, but I want them to actually do the jobs that they are supposed to be doing, which is write the good policy based on science, don't corner cut, make sure that you're supporting people so that we have a clean lake and a livable climate for the future. What we see now is abdication of responsibility, and that's just not going to cut it. We reached out to the government because we were talking about this and we received uh, a statement from the Office of the Ministry of Transportation. Just a, a reminder, this is just partial uh, what the statement sure. was. Uh, the government says, Ontario's population is growing rapidly and we need new infrastructure to keep our people and goods moving while strengthening our economy. The Bradford Bypass is being built in accordance with Ontario's robust environmental assessment EA process. We are currently undertaking work to update the original EA for the project, which includes 16 environmental studies. Despite attempts from our opponents to maintain the status quo, our government is building critical transportation infrastructure, including the Bradford Bypass, which communities of Simcoe County and York Region overwhelmingly support. I would like to get a reaction from all of you. Dave, I'll start with you. Certainly. I mean, um, nothing new there, um, you know, from my perspective with respect to the statement. But look, I mean, 
Um, you know, they talk about updating the uh, the EAs and, and the appropriate studies, and so I mean, I, that's good. That's something that our council very specifically asked for. Um, you know, I hope that uh, come the future, they also involve voluntarily involve the conservation authority with respect to uh, oversight. That's something as well our uh, our councils asked for. But look, at the end of the day, um, you know, I understand they have a mandate, and they were elected, you know, in part based upon the bypass. And so, at some level, um, you know, we recognize from the east west perspective in Georgina is is we do uh, we do have a bit of a a challenge there without um, with, without some sort of additional connection to the Trans Canada from the 404. So, Margaret. Uh, well, I think it's interesting that the status quo, um, no one here on this panel is going to say that we don't need infrastructure, that we don't need to move people, and we don't need houses, but this government only knows how to think in grey and remove green. And so we want to see transit, we want to see those places built that are vibrant, that help both of their communities. And as far as maintaining the status quo, I mean, frankly, they are building from the playbook of the 1950s of how you build communities, you pave over this and you build some houses in a subdivision, you cut, cut out the farms. This, that is the status status quo. They are the harbingers of status quo. We are the ones saying, look, we've improved technology. Communities and other jurisdictions have gone past this 50, 70 year experiment of suburbia. Uh, we're trying to actually bring you into the future, not, in, not drag you from the past here. I'm Claire. Yeah, I think it's interesting that the focus of questions about Lake Simcoe are a defense of a sprawl agenda, basically, um, which just underscores to me that there's a real disconnect with this provincial government about what is actually needed to protect our environment. And so, as Margaret and, um, and Dave have said, you know, we need to build our communities in a way that is more dense and sustainable, it also has the added benefit of providing affordable housing. And we're in an affordable housing crisis right now, right? So let's do things that have multiple benefits and stop wasting money on projects like the Bradford Bypass that are going to harm Lake Simcoe so that we can shovel more money into saving it. Like, I just want us to make sustainable decisions. Jonathan. Well, my community certainly recognizes the need for an east-west artery across our region. It, that had been proposed over 40 years ago. The exact shape that it takes, I think, always needs to be studied and scrutinized, and the process needs to be transparent. I work quite closely with the Minister of Transportation. She happens to be our MPP on a lot of files. And so in order to deliver the infrastructure that we need to deal with our traffic problem, to Margaret's point, it also has to include transit. We have a GO train station right in the middle of my ward. My ward is also the eye of the storm for all the regional traffic that currently treats my downtown like a de facto highway. So to me, it has to be all done, all the growth, all the development, all the environmental impacts in a sustainable, transparent, and rational way. But at the end of the day, our, ours is a region that's grown exponentially. When I left town for university, we were 14,000. When I came back, we were 45,000. We have to do these things in a coordinated way. and. That also means having the environment front and center and making sure that for anything, if there is an impact, there has to be an offset to compensate. Thank you all for coming in to Toronto uh, all this way. We really appreciate your time and expertise and helping us understand this issue. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Great. Since at least 1995, Peregrine Falcons have nested 18 stories up on the Sheridan Hotel in downtown Hamilton, and throughout that time, volunteers with Hamilton's Falcon Watch have worked to protect them. Whenever there are chicks, Falcon Watch works to band them for conservation purposes, and this year, the nesting pair, McKeever and Judson, have four. Banding is a really exciting process, and it starts when a climber scales down the outside of the hotel to bring the chicks inside. They actually have to stay on the ledge during the banding to make sure that the parents don't realize their babies are gone, and this can mean fending off aerial attacks from angry mother falcons. Once inside, the chicks are weighed to determine their sex. They receive a band, a blood test, and a name. The lightweight bands help prevent the birds from being captured for falconry, and they also help monitor the peregrine falcon population, which was considered endangered in Ontario from 1973 to 2006 and is now considered a species of special concern. This year's chicks are named after Hamilton neighborhoods, Kirkendall, Gibson, Delta, and Stipley. And now the wait is on for them to learn to fly. For more coverage of Hamilton Falcon Watch, you can check out my articles on tvo.org.
The agenda this week considered obstacles to getting big things built in Ontario, explored whether laneway houses can help with a housing crunch, and heard why Mississauga Mayor Bonnie Crombie may be off to Queen's Park. The Agenda's Week in Review begins with a reaction to last night's debate among candidates for Mayor of Toronto. Okay, you've been through this before, so naturally I want to start with you. You've been on a debate stage. You know what they've been through. How'd they do? I actually think they did really well. And the first thing I'll say is that um, it's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> it's really tough to be up there, and I think all of them did extremely well. Uh, there's, I think there's some highlights, definitely. The trick in a debate is getting people off their talking notes. You know, I heard a lot tonight that you can read on a website, you've seen it tweeted before, you've heard it in a conversation before, and that's not really the interesting parts. I think the, the moments, you know, the repetitive bits, you know, Mitzi Hunter was pretty repetitive. She's costed a budget. Uh, there was the repetitive bits, the jabs at Chow about, about raising taxes. That wasn't really the interesting part. It's not informative. It doesn't actually really enable people to weigh the options and the character of these different candidates. And I think when they really got into the meat of it, you started to see some of the personalities on stage, which gives you a sense of how they really work together, as opposed to actually just you know hearing hearsay about how they work together or the, those, the talking notes that they have. So I would say overall, I think there's some pretty good tidbits for us to extract from that debate. I think we have six extremely capable candidates. Whether or not they have a great track record or not is something we should litigate in the next hour. <laughs> but I think that, you know, that was a, you know, I'm comparing it to what I watch on American television, and that was a pretty damn good conversation that just took place. Sabine, your view. Yeah, it, you know, I, I used to do debate coach prep for candidates of all sorts, and. And what you try and do is you get them ready to do a series of almost like 30 second commercials or 60 second commercials because one way of playing for a debate is, uh, is uh, risk mitigation. You know, you get your key messages out, you don't get pushed off. Uh, what's really fun is when you actually see them, a bit of spark, a bit of a sense of humor. Uh, because, you know, the, the role of the mayor, it, it isn't like the role of the premier or anybody in a Westminster system. It really is, you know, a horseshoe uh, with, uh, you know, the strong mayor powers notwithstanding. It, it, uh, it's a place where people have to work together. And so I think it's right. Like, it, it, they managed, uh, they managed to, to disagree without being disagreeable to a very large measure. You know, a few sparks here and there. But I, I thought it was, it was pretty good. And it was also pretty good to see a group of people who actually looked kind of like what you'd see if you gone on a TTC subway car. Like it, it was, you know, diversity, yay, you know, <laughs> and it, it, it should be taken for granted, but you can't take it for granted. So that was nice. Sabrina. I agree. It was wonderful to see some of the personalities come out and even some of the bickering back and forth because when voters look at who they're going to elect, they look at two things. Yes, there's the policies and the platforms, and do you agree with those? But beyond that, is this politician, is this candidate lying to me? What are they going to do when there are challenges or unexpected crises? Like, what is their character? And here we actually got to see a glimpse of that, I think perhaps really for the first time. And we got to see the candidates beyond, again, what's just on their websites. And I know I walked away feeling like I knew them better and who I would trust more to follow through on some of these critical issues that were raised. And I'm sure a lot of viewers felt the same. Alicia. This feels kind of like being on a hockey panel, like analyzing what just happened. But um, <laughs> I've watched maybe four or five debates so far. So you are hearing the same things repeated over and over, and maybe some of the stories kind of lose their passion when you're hearing them, you know, friends in basements, um, all, of, all of those things. But I think people who aren't following it very closely are not really looking for the sort of streams of policy things that maybe you only understand if you're like following housing very closely. Um, they're looking to connect with people, like Sabrina talked about trust, they're looking to see who represents them. We've heard, I think, most powerfully, the personal stories of the candidates, I think, come across really well in these debates. We have people who immigrated here, we have people who um, grew up in low-income families, people who have different experiences that represent the, pe the people of Toronto in a way that we don't often see on these stages, and I think that is what's really coming across in these kinds of debates. 
Sabrina, I want to follow up on something you just said, because you said character emerges when you see a good interchange of ideas like this. Build on that, if you would, a little bit. What, what character emerged here that connected with you? I think you see someone has some fight in them, that passion, if they really care about the issue beyond the talking points. And I think when you saw some of those battles between Josh or Brad or Mark, you really saw, even if you agree or disagree with their respective policies, that they're really in it, they believe it, they're standing behind they're standing behind what they're talking about. Whereas I felt with some of the others, other personal anecdotes, like Olivia seemed to have one for everything. And, you know, she's gesturing wildly, but the conviction for me just wasn't there. It rang hollow. Uh, she says she understands people, but does she really when you talk about engagement with voters? She's been in politics a long time. If she was that good at engaging people, she would have been elected by now. Uh, so I think that was what I took away from it. Shoshana to you first. What does this saga of trying to build this light rail transit line 100 meters north of where we're sitting right now, what does this tell us about our ability to build big, thing, big things these days? I think it tells us that we're wishing that it could be cheap and easy and free, and so we're searching for a magic formula that will make hard, expensive things easy to build and that there isn't a magic formula. Hard big things are hard big things and we're gonna to have to build them and we should be realistic about this. Part of the challenge with Eglinton is that it was the first PPP structure for a transit line in the city. Public-private partnership. Public-private partnership, thank you. And we didn't have very much experience with that. We took how we usually did things, run by the TTC, and we decided to do it in a totally new way because we thought it would be better, cheaper, faster. And actually doing things in new and different ways can be harder, slower learning experience. And when we give over a very important public works project to the private sector, we lose some of the control over what happens to it. The 407 was a hard big thing, took less time than the Eglinton LRT. Maple Leaf Gardens was a hard big thing, took less time than the Eglinton LRT. Why can't we do these things anymore? Well, Maple Leaf Gardens was a building. We actually build buildings better than we do linear infrastructure. Highways we have more experience on than actually transit. We stopped building transit. You know, the or I looked up line one and line two. They each took about five years to build, decades to plan, because the politics of it slowed it down. Mm -hmm. So those two took time in a city that was not nearly developed. What we this found with the, the, the young the young, the young the blue line, line, the young line, seventy and years the blue ago. Line. Yeah, exactly. Each took about five years to build line one and line two. So it's always taken us time to build that. But Shoshana's is right that you know across Eglinton, in a city that is substantially built, we ran into a bunch of unknown unknowns. Right? Um, you <laughs> thank know, you, and, Donald Rumsfeld. And, and, <laughs> thank you, Donald Rumsfeld. And uh, and we stopped building transit. Now we're trying to catch up and it's not easy. Joe, can you explain it? I think the other honest reason is there were too many people uh, involved in the construction. So if you, if you look at who's involved in Agnuson, uh, you have the province through Infrastructure Ontario uh, and then through Metrolinx uh, and then you have the city uh, involved through the TTC. Uh, and I suspect that's one too many people at the party. The, the, the trick on successful uh, implementation of big projects seems to be to have your financer, your builder, and your client operator all part of the construction management team. Uh, it, it's, it's not quite clear to me, honestly, what the, the TTC sort of seemed to be half in and half out on, on, on this one. And, and um, so that, that always sets up friction uh, and it always sets up uh, uh, authority without responsibility at the end of a project, which is the worst time uh, for people to do that. Um, so I think there was some real confusion in the structural management of that project. And this is, again, not atypical. Uh, the successful projects, and we can talk about that uh, in a while, are, I think, uh, governments and cities who have managed to organize who's in charge, what are we doing, who's going to run it, who's going to pay for it, get that sorted early, uh, and then construction uh, can, can, uh, can proceed more, more easily. But even then, you're going to run into trouble because of the unknown unknowns. Right? I want to get Drew on this for a second, because that, that uh, I want to find out if there are too many chefs in the kitchen here, because Infrastructure Ontario, Metrolinx, Toronto Transit Commission, let's not forget about the Ministry of Transportation, 
the minister is uh, allegedly overseeing this Ministry whole thing. of Infrastructure. Ministry of Infrastructure. Uh, the, the consortium of four companies that is actually building this thing. The They're, city. City of Toronto. Okay. Are there too and, many cooks in the kitchen? And the feds. The, the feds, feds are largely a funder. They're a silent partner on this project. They will increasingly not become a silent partner because they have a much bigger budget to spend on infrastructure and they expect to have a bigger say. So we have a very complicated governance, both horizontally in terms of many players within each order of government and vertically among the orders of government. That theoretically should lead to better decisions. It often leads actually to worse. And the other challenge is if we compare ourselves to other countries, Australia, New Zealand, who are facing the same challenge with regard to building out infrastructure after decades of not doing it, the balance between good politics and good policy is different. The focus on good policy is stronger. It doesn't mean that at the end of the day, the politicians don't make the final decision, but there's an expectation that they defer to experts. And if at the end of the day, they decide that they want to take their own advice and go with a project that may not fit the parameters in terms of cost benefit analysis of the experts, they have to face public studies that say otherwise. Here, actually, the process is a little too private and the balance isn't quite right. In your experience, do people who own homes want to be in a position of being sort of mom and pop real estate developers slash landlords? What I've seen is there's sort of two categories. Mm -hmm. There's the homeowner type, which I think is what you're describing, where to, you know, they live in the principal residence and they rent out the second or the third unit. There's also the property owner type, which is they don't reside there, but they rent out the entire unit. So there's sort of two categories. In Kingston, primarily, the majority of the take up has been on the property owners, so full rentals as opposed to homeowners. But to some of the points that uh, the other panelists have made about for homeowners right now where buying a home is perhaps getting a little bit far-reaching this helps offset the mortgage mm -hmm. and the payments associated with that and it also provides more rental units on the market so which, people are game to do it absolutely hmm. yeah. okay Christine um, I want to circle back to something you said earlier mm -hmm. at, the, at the moment you, you, if you're putting a garden suite in your backyard or something like that uh, you can't sever that and sell that can you to somebody else. You're just no, a tenant at that point. Not right? in Toronto, not at the not moment. Not in Toronto, right. No, should it be that way? I think it should. Um, I look at uh, London, England has Muse housing, which was old carriage houses behind the main house that are all mainly independent properties now and very, very affluent neighborhoods sort of within the main neighborhoods. Um, so I, I think they should be severed, uh, ultimately, if that's what people desire. But I think we need to see those laneway houses or those laneways becoming their own kind of streets mm. in a way. And um, as Greg had mentioned, you know, cycling down the laneways, you start to see people living and occupying and um, making their mark on those spaces. We'll see that more and more and it will become the next natural step. Any thought to that, Greg, allowing severance and purchase of those smaller suites on the edges of the property? Yeah, you know, first things first, we need rental housing in this city. Uh, more than anything else, we need um, that flexible housing stock. We're not building enough rental housing for all kinds of other reasons. It would probably take another panel to cover. <laughs> but uh, uh, the, the provincial direction is certainly accessory dwelling units on the same lot. Um, tethered to the main house for, for water and, and, and hydro. Um, and that's the principal opportunity here is I think to expand housing options through that means. Uh, there could be the odd, the odd one that you know, makes sense to sever, but the whole thrust of the, of the policy direction has been uh, rental housing and, and associating it with, with the, main, the main dwelling. Gotcha. Can you take us back to 1998? This was amalgamation year, I guess, right. for Kingston. What did you do in that city to kind of make all of this easier to have happen? Oh, well, um, I don't know if it exactly happened in 1998. Um, we actually just passed our consolidated zoning bylaw last year. You're it took, kidding. It took us 20 years. <laughs> wow. Why? Uh, it's just one of those projects that got pushed <laughs> off and off and didn't get done. But I'm very thankful we have one zoning bylaw now, not five. 
So one zoning bylaw instead of five allowed yeah. you to happen, but it took 20 years for that one zoning bylaw to be approved. It did. That's an, another story onto itself, absolutely. We've got lots of show ideas here for yeah. future shows, apparently. Uh, okay, do we have that problem when we went mega city in Toronto in 1997? We, we uh, I would say, the, the ability to have this dates back to, I think, 2003. If, and I'm nodding at my planning, uh, my planning friend here. But uh, the city did not really get its act together until much more recently with, with laneway suites. Uh, we've, had, we've had permission for secondary suites, you know, house a, a, a unit in the basement for quite a number of years. But we had certain tests associated with that. So I would say a lot of hesitancy about this. And something happened, and I think it was the housing crisis, the housing challenge, the mm -hmm. fact, frankly, that more people were feeling the affordability pinch than they had previously. Um, and, and not that a lot of people haven't been feeling that affordability pinch for a long, long time. They have. But old so habits die hard. Old habits die hard. And I think this evolution has picked up speed and people's values are changing, changing about it. The norms are changing about it. The, the way that people talk about housing today, um, it, that, that wasn't in the conversation the way it was maybe 15 years ago. And it's probably next to parking, unfortunately, <laughs> the, the number one issue. Thing. Let, let's go back to Sudbury. Uh, Angel, how about in, in Sudbury? Do, what is the sense at City Hall as to whether or not uh, the city mothers and fathers have truly embraced these new and different ideas in terms of dealing with the housing crunch? I think Sudbury is definitely uh, embracing some of these new ideas. I know even kind of the tiny homes concept is, is becoming a little bit of a popular um, idea throughout the um, city and in the uh, in the zoning bylaws. Uh, they're, they're looking how, at how tiny is a tiny can, home, incidentally. Uh, I think roughly around 400 to 500 square feet. That's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> so and the idea, the concept of that is really to, uh, there, it's kind of this co-housing uh, type of uh, format where uh, you may have kind of a commute, the, the primary residence is sort of like has its communal um, kitchen and laundry and stuff like that. And then your tiny home is uh, really for kind of your sleeping, uh, you have a study area, washroom, uh, but it can get larger than that. So uh, some some interesting concepts would be to essentially, you know, could you could you have a tiny home that's on a larger uh, lot and sever that lot and and you start integrating that into the uh, neighborhood fabric. Why would you want this job? Well, look, um, I'm interested in bringing the province back to the center. The current administration, um, I have some issues with their approach and the way they do business, and they're far too far to the right, the opposition too far to the left. I'm a centrist, I'm fiscally responsible, but yet I'm the, uh, very socially progressive. So I'd like to see more transparency, more accountability, um, and tighter fiscal management all at the same time. I will tell you what the turning point was for me, if that interests mm -hmm. you. I've met people in Hamilton, I've met people in Ottawa. In Ottawa, I had a young woman come up to me and she said, you're my mayor. I trust you. I have confidence in your leadership skills. I like your management style. You're a strong fiscal manager. And I agree with your, uh, your decisions and have confidence in them. I don't want you going anywhere. And I said, you know what, I really appreciate your comments. Thank you so much. I said, what if I took that same management style, that same fiscal responsible approach that you define, and what if I applied that to towns and municipalities right across the province and to the province's finance in general? Do you think we all could be better off? That same transparent, accountable approach that you have credited me for, which I am very accountable and very transparent. What'd Would say? we be better off? And she said, a light went off, I could see it because you've got me. You're right. Please proceed. Okay. I, I, the reason I ask the question is you are arguably vying for, or ultimately potentially vying for, the worst job in politics today. Why? Because the Ontario Liberals are, you know, according to so many people in this province, a spent force. You've come third, no, you're not you yet, but the Ontario Liberals have come third two elections in a row. That's never happened in 156 years. 
The current Prime Minister's lack of popularity at the moment, you'll excuse me for saying, is an albatross around the neck of the Ontario Liberal Party. The NDP have a pretty new leader who is yeah, she's terrific. young and dynamic and respected and mm -hmm. could make an alternative case uh, to Doug Ford if and when that time comes. So how would you convince us that this job that you are vying for is worth more than a bucket of spit? <laughs> well, look what happened federally. They went from, uh, Justin Trudeau took them from fifth place party to majority government. I think that can be, uh, that can be repeated. I think they were only in third, weren't they? Oh, I think they were in fifth. Really? I got to <laughs> well, look Well, you at can that. look back and check. Uh, you're we'll the, check it out. You're no, the that's true. They went, you know, they I went think, from well back to, to majority. Correct. Back. I think it needs someone the, to ignite the brand and to reinvigorate the brand and have those policy discussions at the local level. And it takes someone of profile and preeminence. And I think that I have worked hard and built a certain profile and, and, and certain reputation. And I think I could be that person. Now, if we get into this race and we have great discussion and debate and other, other individuals, other candidates, Candidates are willing to put forward the centrist views as I am because I believe in governing from center or slightly right of the center. If we can come together, maybe I'll have done my work. But that's just some of what we covered this week. You can find more, including the full conversations, on our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. And that's all for this Friday, May 26, 2023. Now that the election interference report has landed from the federal government's special rapporteur, David Johnson, Monday will assess what's needed for Canada to move forward. I'm Nam Kiwanuka. Thanks for watching TVO and for joining us online at tvo.org. Have a great weekend, and Steve will see you on Monday. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.